Hey, what's up guys? You're right on time. Hey, question. Um, how many of you are still friends with your exes? You know, I mean like just really just platonic friends. Now I know it can be tricky, but it can be done. Um, what if though, one of your friends who was an ex said, hey listen, um, would you mind if I bring my fiance over to do serious bodily harm? What's up with that, right? Well, today we have an odd couple who apparently had that kind of understanding and we're gonna get into it, so buckle your seatbelts. Until then, why don't you just meet me in the kitchen? I'll see you in there in a minute. Yeah, I plead the fifth. Now to an investigator, hearing those words uttered by a person of interest is a direct sign that person knows their rights in refusing to speak or to aid law enforcement. The invocation of the Fifth Amendment of the U.S. Constitution, specifically the clause that guarantees the right against self-incrimination, is one of the most known protections applied most publicly during televised congressional hearings and police interrogations. But another of the most basic concepts of justice and fairness are protected just as much in the double jeopardy clause of that same Fifth Amendment. At the heart of the double jeopardy clause is the idea that an innocent person should not be harangued endlessly for prosecution for the same criminal charges. Now this concept of fairness in the legal system can be traced back to antiquity. But our case today is about much more than just the Bill of Rights. It's about an unquenchable thirst for control and a descent into evil that would swallow whole an innocent victim and leave unhealed heartache in its wake. While it might leave a bad taste, there could also be some just desserts. Today we're talking about Mel Ignato and the kind of murder that will challenge your palate's tolerance for double jeopardy. My name is Ronnie and welcome to RV Crime Kitchen where we serve up murder mysteries along with cuisine inspired from the locations of those tragic events. Right here from my RV in the heart of New York City. The location of the crime, Louisville, Kentucky. Today's dish, Kentucky Hot Brown. Let's cook. Our case takes us to Louisville, Kentucky, population of 618,000, home to the University of Louisville Cardinals, Louisville Slugger Museum and Factory, and the birthplace of the greatest of all time, Muhammad Ali. Louisville is considered a great place to visit. Additional attractions are Churchill Downs, the Belle of Louisville Riverboat Cruise, and the Kentucky Bourbon Trail. Louisville is the birthplace of American bourbon, owing its unique flavor to Kentucky's limestone-rich soil. And fun fact, 
In 2012, Zagat named it the only U.S. city to be on the eight awesome foodie getaways. It was here that Brenda Sue Schaefer was born on April 25th, 1952, to Essie and John Schaefer. Brenda was the youngest of six, and her older brothers took turns protecting her. Brenda was particularly close to her mother and was considered mom's shadow of the family. She would grow to be a very beautiful brunette who settled into a career as a nursing assistant. In 1986, 34-year-old Brenda Sue Schaefer first began dating Melvin Henry Ignato, 48. They met on a blind date set up by friends. Melvin, a divorced father of three adult children, made a comfortable living as a buyer for an Asian import-export company. He traveled the world for his job and lived in a large home in the Louisville area that he shared with his mother. Melvin and Brenda presented as somewhat of an odd couple. Brenda was cute, had a nice smile, and people liked being around her. Whereas Mel was kind of homely and somewhat demanding. But it could be said that what he lacked in dashing good looks, Mel made up for with his ability and willingness to spend freely. During their first year together, friends of Brenda noted that she would often compliment Mel as being very attentive to her and caring. Brenda, like Mel, had been married before. She married her high school sweetheart when she was only 19. Within 10 years, she and her husband had called it quits. By this time in her life, Brenda had expressed a keen interest in older men. By Valentine's Day in 1987, Mel had presented Brenda with a 2.3 carat diamond engagement ring and marriage proposal. Brenda accepted. However, friends say she confided that she was less than enthusiastic at the idea of being the next Mrs. Ignato. Mel may have had some idea of her misgivings because according to his son Michael, when Mel announced the engagement to his kids, Brenda was not even there. Michael merely chalked up the weird announcement to his father's quirkiness, or it could have been something else. Mel and his wife raised Michael and his two older sisters. Michael described his father as a cheerful man with a good disposition for most of his early years. But when Mel and his wife divorced in 1973, Mel started to go through a personality change. He became very short-tempered and would yell and scream at his kids over the smallest perceived slight. In fact, Mel had become a domineering control freak even back then. Chores, tasks, schoolwork, everything had to be done perfectly or a tongue lashing was surely to follow. Enter Mary Ann Shore. Marianne, once Mel's secretary, was in her early 20s when Mel was in his 30s. She would often use manipulation tactics to control Michael and his sisters when she babysat for them during Mel's two week long work trips. She would do things like damage furniture knowing that Mel would blame the kids. She told Michael she could be his best friend or his worst enemy. If Michael did not tell Mel how much he liked her, Marianne would tell lies to get him in trouble. It was apparent to the kids that Marianne wanted Mel all to herself and wanted the kids out of the house. Over the next 10 years, Mel and Marianne would break up and make up repeatedly. By the time Michael moved out of the house at age 18, Mel introduced him to Brenda Schaefer, who, according to Michael, was a breath of fresh air following Marianne Shore. This really brings us to the engagement announcement. Remember when I said Brenda, the bride-to-be, wasn't even at the dinner? Well, that's because she had already changed her mind and rejected Mel's proposal. 
That's right. Mel announced something that was no longer even going to happen. This would not become known until after. On September 25th, 1988, in the suburbs of Louisville, Ellie Schaefer had waited up for her daughter to return home from a date with her fiancé, Mel. Brenda, who was very reliable and punctual, had told her family that she would be back by a certain time, but it was now 3 o'clock in the morning and still no word from Brenda. This was highly unlike her. Mel told Essie that he last saw Brenda at 11.30 p.m. the previous night when they parted ways after Brenda dropped him off home. They had spent the day together, according to Mel, going out to dinner and enjoying a walk in the park along the river. The next morning, Brenda's Buick Regal had been found by police on I-65, just a few hundred feet from her home. The car had been vandalized, with the windows busted out, car stereo ripped out. One of the rear tires had also been punctured. Police found this scene suspicious, as Brenda could have easily just walked home from this location if she had just stalled. Brenda's family almost immediately suspected Mel. Her parents, brothers Mike and Tom, and Tom's then girlfriend Linda, all recalled Brenda making progressively worse allegations of domestic abuse by Mel. This had been going on for weeks, according to them. And Brenda had been telling them that she had just been biding her time with the intent on breaking off the engagement. Brenda confided in Linda that Mel had been making more and more sexual demands of her ever since he lost his job. According to Linda, Brenda was definitely contemplating leaving him for good, but may have been trying to build up the nerve to do so considering Mel's short temper. Moreover, Brenda's family did not even think Mel was on her level, and he knew it. They thought once he lost his job, he would soon lose his grip on his relationship with Brenda. Linda told investigators that Mel was constantly trying to get Brenda to be more sexually liberated with him. Instead of using things like charisma and personality, to keep the spice alive, Mel was ordered to explicit adult videos and ambushing her with cloth soaked in chloroform. Linda told the cops that on the night of her disappearance, Brenda had planned to return Mel's engagement ring and to focus on a relationship that she had recently rekindled with an old boyfriend. By now, Police had zeroed in on Mel as a prime suspect in Brenda's disappearance, but he continued to deny any wrongdoing. But Brenda's boss, Dr. William Spaulding, had grown fed up with the pace of the police investigation. He, like most familiar with the case, firmly believed Mel was responsible and took measures to turn up the pressure. He gave interviews to local media that had been covering the case where he flat out accused Mel of kidnapping and murdering Brenda. Later, he sent Mel an anonymous letter in March of 1989 threatening to kill him if he didn't reveal the whereabouts of Brenda's body. Mel alerted the police who interviewed Dr. Spaulding as a likely source of the letter given his most recent complaints to investigators. Spaulding admitted to writing the letter, prompting the police to charge him with making terrorist threats. Five months later, Dr. Spaulding went on trial. Mel testified that the letter made him fear for his safety. 
Dr. Spaulding was found guilty of a misdemeanor and fined $300. During the trial, Mel continued to deny any wrongdoing in Brenda's disappearance. At this point, the feds needed a Hail Mary to salvage the investigation and to keep the case from going cold. So they invited Mel to testify at a grand jury in order to give him the opportunity of finally clearing his name once and for all. Against his attorney's advice, Mel agreed. In October 1989, Mel Ignato appeared at the grand jury and gave sworn testimony denying any involvement in Brenda's disappearance. But he did admit to resuming a sexual relationship with his ex-girlfriend, Marianne Shore. Based on this information, the police decided to subpoena Marianne's testimony. During the grand jury hearing, Marianne Shore provided inconsistent testimony that led police to confirm in their minds that she definitely knew what happened to Brenda. At first, Marianne told investigators she had only seen Brenda once. But later, during her testimony, she indicated that she had seen Brenda at least twice. Police knew she was lying. Over the next several weeks, police continued pressuring Marianne for information about Brenda's disappearance. Eventually, she cracked and was ready to talk. Marianne told police that Mel had suspected Brenda of planning to break up with him for some time. Mel had decided if he couldn't have Brenda, no one would. He was going to kill Brenda and he hatched a plan with Marianne to do it. A month before the murder, Mel had dug a hole for Brenda's grave in some woods behind Marianne's home. The night before, he purchased gloves, black trash bags, rope, tape, a camera, film, and a bottle of chloroform. The night before the murder, he took these items along with the wooden paddle to Marianne's house. The night of the murder, Brenda met Mel at his home. She returned some jewelry, including the engagement ring and other gifts, a clear sign she was moving on. It was here and then that Mel pulled a gun on Brenda. They then drove to Marianne's house, and there he tied Brenda up and duct taped her. He then tortured her and assaulted her numerous times over the next several hours. At one point, Mel even assaulted Brenda while she was bound to a glass table. All the while, Marianne took photos of every gruesome and perverted act. Marianne even told police that, in preparation for the kidnapping and assault, she and Mel sound tested the home's insulation to make sure her house was scream proof. They did this by having Mel stand several yards outside the house while Marianne screamed as loud as she could inside the home. During the entire assault, Mel ordered Marianne to take dozens of photographs as his own demented keepsakes. Finally, Mel killed Marianne by smothering her face with the chloroform soaked towel. He then tied up Brenda's body and carried her to the pre dug grave in the woods behind Marianne's house. Prosecutors offered Marianne the chance to plead to the lesser charge of tampering with evidence in exchange for her cooperation in testifying against Mel at trial. She agreed. 
After investigators wired her, Marianne initiated a series of phone calls to get Mel to talk about the crime. She expressed concern to Mel that the FBI was not letting up, that they had been relentless in questioning her. She also told Mel that she was worried that the property behind her home would eventually be developed and that building contractors would discover Brenda's body. Mel just berated her, telling her that the feds had nothing and that she was acting weak. Mel also mentioned that they were never going to find what they buried because it was too deep. He was confident that investigators would never find Brenda's body, though he never actually mentioned Brenda's name in any of the conversations that were taped. Regardless, on January 10th, 1990, believing they had enough for a conviction, police arrested Ignato for the murder of Brenda Sue Schaefer. Using a cadaver sniffing dog, investigators discovered and dug up Brenda's body, right where Mary Ann described. With Mel unable to make the $500,000 bond, he was stuck in Jefferson County Jail until his trial date. Meanwhile, investigators got a warrant to search his home for evidence of the crime. They recovered the camera and paddle, but not the pictures. But having motive, opportunity, a body, and an eyewitness, prosecutors felt good about their chances for conviction. The trial began in December of 1991, three years after Brenda's murder. The defense successfully moved the trial to another county 100 miles away where the case had less notoriety. The jury had the secretly recorded tapes of Mel and Marianne's conversations about the police investigation. But the government relied heavily on the eyewitness testimony of Marianne herself. Unfortunately for the prosecution, Marianne did not make a very good witness. She wore a tight skirt, dyed her hair a dirty blonde, and had a very nonchalant demeanor when describing the horrific events of Brenda's murder. She also laughed at inappropriate times. Eventually, the defense accused Marianne of the murder, citing that she was in love with Mel and that she was jealous of Brenda and would do anything to eliminate her from the picture. She admitted to having a small role in paddling Brenda and admitted to helping to carry her body to the gravesite. The jury did not find Marianne incredible, and without any physical evidence on Brenda's heavily decomposed body or a confession mentioning Brenda or her murder on tape, Mel Ignato was acquitted of all charges. Brenda's family, the people of Louisville, and even the judge were outraged by the jury's decision. The judge took the unusual step of writing the Schaefer family a letter apologizing for the jury's decision. It was clear how much the case hung on the testimony of Mary Ann. But because Mary Ann entered a plea for evidence tampering, she was sentenced to the maximum of five years. She would end up serving three years total. By this time, Mel was on top of the world. He had beaten a murder rap and had moved back in with his son, Michael. He had to sell his home to pay for his legal defense. He was destitute, but at least he was free for the moment. The new homeowners were well aware of Mel's legal problems. Federal prosecutors wanted to file perjury charges against Mel, confident that he had lied under oath regarding his involvement in Brenda's murder. They tried without success to get permission from the new homeowners to search the home for a third time. Despite this setback, the government proceeded with the perjury prosecution. But 
By October 1992, only a few days before the jury trial, the new homeowners made a critical discovery. A carpet layer, hired to change the rug in one of the hallways, discovered an air vent that had a bag taped to its underside. The bag contained some jewelry and rolls of undeveloped film. The homeowners immediately contacted the FBI. The photos confirmed everything Mary Ann Shore told investigators. Over 100 pictures depicting Brenda in various stages of bondage and being tortured and abused. Although his face never appeared in any of the photos, moles and hair patterns identified Melignato as the abuser. Prosecutors knew that they were unable to retry Mel for Brenda's murder. The double jeopardy clause of the Fifth Amendment of the U.S. Constitution does not allow it. Because Ignato had been acquitted of murder, along with six other charges in his first trial, he could not be tried again with any of them, despite this new, clear evidence of his guilt. The double jeopardy clause forbids it, with the relevant language being, nor shall any person subject for the same offense be twice put in jeopardy of life or limb. Jeopardy attaches when a jury is impaneled, the first witness is sworn in, or when a plea is rendered. Again, the protection afforded by the Double Jeopardy Clause has been fundamentally adopted by cultures throughout history worldwide, dating back to antiquity. It's been deemed a basic fairness to encourage the state to get their prosecution right the first time. This is to prevent an innocent citizen from having to live under the constant threat of prosecution for the same offense. Prosecutors knew the maximum they could get for a perjury conviction in a trial was 10 years, so they made a deal. They offered Mel eight years if he made a full confession so that the family could get closure. He agreed. Mel confessed to having kidnapped, tortured, and sexually assaulted Brenda before killing her with chloroform. He was then shipped off to federal prison. About a week before he was released in October 1997, his Kentucky State Court perjury trial commenced for lying in the trial of Dr. Spaulding. The state court found him guilty and he was sentenced to an additional nine years. After being released from prison in 2006, Mel moved back to Louisville where he lived with Michael while on parole. He lived out the rest of his days alone in an apartment close to where he murdered Brenda. On September 1st, 2008, Michael stopped by his father's apartment to check on him. He discovered Mel sitting on the floor with a deep gash on his leg and broken glass from a table nearby. Mel was dead. He apparently fell and Rather than call 911, simply bled out. He was 70 years old. And there you have it, guys. There it's the story of Mel Ignato. Real piece of crap who died the way he should have. Alone. Penniless. Friendless. And likely nobody cared about him. So... I guess karma took over and did what it's supposed to do. Um, you know, it's kind of true what they say. Um, adversity really reveals the true you. Um, you know, I guess he went through his fair share. And it revealed the true him. A monster. Unfortunately, uh, Brenda's family, specifically her parents, they actually died prior to Mel's first trial. So they never even got to see him get any kind of justice. Um, but, yeah. Glad he's gone. And, um, guys, I'm actually really curious to see 
how your versions of the Kentucky hot brown turned out. Um, if you used any, if you substituted any, maybe some more healthier ingredients. Um, I liked mine. Definitely not something I can eat every day, but it was delicious. And so, yeah, let me know in the comments um, how you liked it, how it turned out. And thank you very much for stopping by RV Crime Kitchen. Make sure you like and subscribe if you like the content. And click the bell icon to get updates when I upload another video, which I will do once a week. So, again, I'm Ronnie. Thanks for coming by, and I will see you on the next one. Take care. Bye-bye.